Hello everyone and welcome to this second episode of the series of the FIP Development Goal events. Today we'll be talking about Development Goal 18, access to medicines, devices and services. We welcome you all from all over the world. On some places it is the morning, others it's the noon and other places it's the evening. Thank you all for being with us and we wish you a pleasant time with us. Um, we are happy, my uh, colleague and I, um, to co-moderate this event. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Desak Ernawati, my colleague, lecturer from uh, Udawaya University and FIP Global Lead for DG4, which is Advanced Practice and Specialization from Indonesia, will be co-moderating this event with me. I am Marwan Ael, an FIP Projects Manager for Workforce, and I am located in Lebanon. Next, please. So, some announcements before we start our webinar. This webinar will be recorded and will be live streamed via Facebook. The recording will be available on our, our website at www.fip.org. And to note, all the DG's event will be available so uh, you can access them anytime on the website of the FIP. You may also ask questions using the question box provided, and we encourage you to engage with us and to ask questions, especially questions that are directed for our speakers in order to be discussed during the panel discussion at the end of this webinar. You are all welcome to provide feedback to the web to, to us at webinars at fip.org. And if you're still not a member at FIP, please visit the website www.fip.org and go to the membership registration and become a member. So today it is World Health Day. So April 7 is known to be the World Health Day and building a fairer and healthier world is the new campaign launched by WHO. This year's theme is equity. And we do know that our world is an unequal one, but the problem can be preventable. How? By ensuring that all people are able to access quality health services when and where they need them. And here comes the word access that is directly related to our DG18 event, which is access to medicines, devices, and services. So, Setting goals for the decade ahead, we will be having a series of 21 events for the 21 goals in 2021. Next slide, please. So our outcomes of the 21 digital events is to mobilize global pharmacy development and transformation through our development goals. By engaging our profession, members and colleagues everywhere we aim to provide a description, a direction, and a context for each specific goal so that everyone knows what this goal is about and how to improve it or implement it. Monitor and evaluate through data evidence and identify priorities across practice, science, workforce, and education. Next slide, please. So, as we told you, we have the 21 events that are spread over the 2021 year. So our setting goals for the decade ahead event series, we will be having each month around two events. We have started in March with one event, which is equity and equality. And here we go back to the theme of the World Health Day this year, which is equity. And FIP has started this by her first event by the end of March, which was about equity and equality. Today is our second episode, which is access to medicine, services, and devices. And by the end of April, we'll be having the third one. If you look at the calendar, we have around two events per month, except for September, which coincides with the pharmacy week, where we will be having more events. And this, uh, this is why we're having four digital events in September. 
we encourage you all to log into events.fip.org and to register for those events. Next slide, please. So if we look at our FIP vision, and I will be reading the vision as is. Our vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and health technologies, as well as from pharmaceutical care services provided by pharmacists in collaboration with other healthcare professionals. So if we look at our vision, access is there. And in our vision, we also want to know that everyone is involved in order to achieve a better access to the medicines, to the uh, devices, and to the services we provide as pharmacists and as part of the healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. So what are the outcomes of our event? In this fifth development goal 18 event, we will describe the FIP development goals and explain the components of DG18s. We have three elements. First, the workforce and education. Then we'll go to the science element and at the end to the practice element of this goal. We'll also showcase FIP tools, evidence, and resources to support DG18 implementation across the three elements. We will identify priorities across practice, science, and workforce and education. And of course, we want to engage our members in activity to support monitoring and evaluating of the goals through data evidence. And we'll go back to this activity at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. Now I leave the floor to my colleague, Desak Anawati, to present the speakers and to start the presentations. Desak, Thank you. the floor is yours. Thank you, Marwan. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Desa. Today, I'll be your co-moderator. Uh, we will have three uh, guests, speakers, who will talk about science, workforce, and education uh, in relation to the FIP uh, 18 DGs. The first one, we will have Baba Hobain. She's a lecturer from University of Bremen. She's also the global lead for DG7 on advancing integrated services. She's from Germany. And the second one, we will have Geofadi Pauliti. He's the, he's the FIP Scientific Secretary. He's also Associate Dean and Pfeiffer Chair, University of Health Science and Pharmacy, USA. And the last but not least, we will have Emma Paulino. She's from Portugal. She's the Secretary for uh, Professional Secretary uh, at the FIP. Next slide, please. So as we reach to reach one FIP goal, so how can we uh, how can we get uh, to achieve that goal? As you can see here, there are three elements. As uh, Mawan already mentioned earlier, there will be practice, workforce, and education, as well as science. So we can have no pharmaceutical care without a pharmaceutical workforce, and we can have no pharmaceutical care without a scientific foundation for the next decade. Next, please. Uh, these are the 21 uh, development goals from FIP. And so on the next slide, we will hear um, illustration or video on how this, uh, on what are these uh, goals are. Next slide, please.
Thank you, Lina. Next one, please. Yep. Uh, on today's episode, we will have FIP Development Goals 18 on access to medicine, devices, and services, which is uh, mentioned by Mawan earlier uh, during the presentation. Next slide, please. There would be three elements. So the first one will be on workforce and education element. We saw the strategies in place to widen access to medicine and services through a responsive, capable, available, and well-distributed pharmaceutical workforce. The second element on practice that will be on system in place. Globally, we will have system in place to optimize access to effective medicines and pharmaceutical care services through appropriate supply chains, quality standards, self-care and prevention services, and affordable and fair pricing policies, which is equity uh, in line with the theme that we have. And the last one, the last element on science, access uh, globally, we will have access to innovative science and information, new or innovative therapies, new delivery and manufacturing processes. Next one, please. So now we would like to welcome our first speakers. Um, next one, please. Uh, we will have Barbara Hobain. Uh, she will talk about the workforce and education element on FIPDG 18. Over to you, Barbara. Yeah, hello to everyone around the globe. Thank you for having me here and for your interest in this huge topic of access. The next slide, please. I'm going to uh, explain the mechanisms behind this element of workforce and education. So it's about um, the workforce development strategy uh, that should be in line with all the needs in countries and continents. It's about developing medicine expertise competencies in order to provide quality care. And it's about a special patient population and gender and diversity by balances. And uh, additionally, it's uh, also about workforce intelligence and um, respective strategies. The next slide, please. The development goal 18 is related to service provision, medicine expertise, equity and equality and pharmacy intelligence as uh, just uh, shown. The next slide, please, Lina. How do we translate access to actionable preparedness regarding workforce and its education? I would like to distinguish between workforce availability, including migration and um, so shortage, and its development and education, having in mind the three columns of health promotion, illness prevention, and treatment of diseases. Additionally, I will take into account the current environment, like the transformation itself, which is accelerated. Also included are challenges uh, in the health systems, the demographic challenges for all stakeholders, and the um, very speedily evolving information technology. We should pay particular attention to the widening gap between winners and losers that happen at each transformation, including the one we are just living in. The next slide, please, Lina. So now, how can we now serve the mechanisms? In order to really meet the needs and to understand them properly, we work with surveys. For example, the colleagues uh, working on DG7 are working on the results of their survey on services. For the access development goal, I'm thinking of a survey on, um, with, with uh, questions like these, what should the future skill set look like regarding access? To which extent do we need education on digitalization, artificial intelligence and transformation and change? All to ensure access. Who do we need to work with to ensure access? It's the interprofessionalism. And do we need additional education like interprofessional communication and advocacy? How do pharmacists face the increasing complexity? How can FIP support them to be prepared? Where should pharmacists set priorities regarding access? And how can we ensure that the integral role in access pharmacists have is reached better or at all? just to name some of them. 
FIP offers the workforce reference guide with tools and resources. And to me, a workforce exchange platform or work experience exchange platform would be great to enable individuals independent on their national recognition of his or her certificate to go to countries to rotate to understand access in other countries and foreign countries. The next slide, please, Lena. Thank you. Now, I would like to explain my understanding what the practice and science topics mean to workforce education within the one FIP approach. There should be a common understanding of what pharmaceutical access means. Colleagues should know the markets and the dynamics behind the markets. Prices, pricing and risk sharing are themes regarding affordability and an awareness of types of business models and a possible need of adoption should be given. In other branches, we talk about the move from product and services to infrastructure. What would that mean to colleagues at the front line? I would strive for knowledge in health systems, types and designs and certain components and topics in global health, public health, health management and economics. Furthermore, we have to address modern and innovative treatment options, the development and the manufacturing, and not to forget a certain understanding on artificial intelligence and quantum computing and what all that means regarding access. The next slide, please, Lina. Yeah, now I give you an example coming from service provision. Imagine colleagues in a community pharmacy counseling patients on medicine and how to get access to those. As a basis, we take the dimension of patient access as defined by Cohen. With this understanding, they can counsel on new drugs, prices and coverage, co-pays and out-of-pocket expenses. They can explain and advise on compassionate use and pre-approval access programs to get access to innovative treatments. They can explain clinical data generation, evidence-based medicine and treatment guidelines in times of personalized medicine and individualized treatment. Look how important it is right now to have knowledge on real world data and a generation in a pandemic with drugs approved with an emergency use authorization and to help with data for special patient population like the frail elderly. The next slide, please. Yeah, why should we strive for aspects of access now? The transformation and change always come with winners and losers. And the transformation is accelerated by the pandemic. I would love to see only winners, patients and pharmacists, all stakeholders. If we do not move, evolve and educate and train in the most modern way now, we risk become losers. I might have a German bias, but this is what I fear. Patient engagement is a topic and there is an ongoing discussion about shareholder economy versus stakeholder economy. Let us take advantage of these topics and become a more visible stakeholder together with the patients. Educate and train colleagues on these topics. Let's assess the needs in different countries and continents whilst being aware of various gaps between authorities in institutions and between various providers of healthcare services. Access should be an outcome. Let's take advantage of the push-pull effect we know from pharmaceutical chemistry and which we experience particularly now in the pandemic. The need with in the healthcare system is the pull and the pharmacist enabling access um, can push. Yeah, and advocate. Advocate for access and the related development goals and the pharmacist and pharmaceutical scientists in the healthcare system. The next slide, please. I end here with my personal, personal vision and you can call me an idealist, but anyhow, I would love to see two narratives in the near future. And one is my pharmaceutical narrative, the pharmacist and the pharmaceutical scientist as most accessible health professionals are an integral part of the health 
system and they ensure access to pharmaceutical care and value and contribute value. And shouldn't access become a narrative in pharmacy practice, science and workforce and education? It should. Thank you. I hand over. Uh, thank you, Babel, for your insight uh, presentation on the workforce element for this DG18. Uh, next slide, please. For the next one, we will have science element, uh, which be delivered by Giovanni Pauliti on uh, access to innovative science and information. So I give the screen to you, Giovanni. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac, and uh, certainly happy to provide you a brief summary of what FIP has in mind when looking at the scientific component of the FIP Development Goal 18, which is outlined in this slide. Specifically on the next slide, we have um, identified key mechanisms that we feel need to be in place in order to meet that particular goal. And my uh, objective for today is to highlight in a few simple examples how that translates in some real activities that are currently ongoing within the FIP Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences um, with regard to uh, Development Goal 18. Before I go into these examples, maybe I want to uh, take a few minutes to show how the Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences is organized. On the next slide, um, I have individually uh, listed some of the groups that are involved in the Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences supporting those activities. Uh, as we understand, the pharmaceutical sciences is a very broad and diverse field and mainly focuses on the tools that we use in our daily lives to provide services and, as a consequence, facilitate access to some of the medical benefits that we can provide with uh, medication as well as medical devices. And within the Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences, we have the representation of regional scientific member organizations, um, as well as specialized interest groups that focus on particular scientific themes, such as the new medicines, personalized and precision medicine, drug delivery and manufacturing, the regulatory sciences and the quality of medicines and medical devices, the pharmacy practice research. And then we also have a group that is focusing on workforce development, which is the new generation of pharmaceutical scientists. And those groups are available to all FIP members uh, with regards to information that is provided based on the interest of our members. So I certainly encourage you to become a member and take advantage of those opportunities. Now, what are the tools that we're trying to uh, promote in the Development Goal 18 as relevant to the pharmaceutical sciences? On the next slide, I try to highlight some of them. And this certainly uh, can be quite diverse based on the status of the individual countries and regions that you're living in. For some of us, we take it for granted that we have access to our arsenal of pharmaceutical active ingredients, as well as the materials needed to make drug products. But that's not the case across the globe. So we have a focus on the accessibility of quality active pharmaceutical ingredients and excipients that are necessarily uh, tools to prepare safe and efficacious um, medicines, as well as the tools then for medical devices, which we all know in these days have started out with uh, simple access to effective personal protective equipment, which is uh, still not the case across the entire world. We also have uh, some activities with regards to the preparation of drug products, either under standard manufacturing conditions and improvement of manufacturing conditions, which are handled by the drug delivery and manufacturing six, as well as new technologies that we may utilize in the future in order to facilitate access to 
specific medical um, components that are needed in the management of diseases. And that is, for example, the access of high quality 3D printing opportunities for um, personalized medicine. We also wanna make sure that we provide quality information on the safety and efficacy of our medicines and medical devices. It is important that decisions by regulatory authorities are made based on the peer reviewed information of scientific evidence of safety and efficacy. So we have a group in our pharmacy practice research special interest group that is focusing on that and combined with our colleagues in the regulatory sciences and quality six, we have frameworks in place that facilitates information sharing of quality medicine data that can be used for registration um, decisions by regulatory authorities. And this is an ongoing project with the World Health Organization that also provides scientific data um, to the World Health Organization for the essential medicine list. Finally, I wanna mention also the importance of the workforce that is required in order to develop and maintain access to those ingredients that we all depend on in order to have the tools available. So we're talking about the workforce in pharmaceutical sciences. This needs to be handed over not only to the universities, but in partnership with the stakeholders of the entire uh, medicine supply chain as well. And that includes pharmacists and other healthcare professionals as well. So we have a good understanding of the needs and can focus our activities in pharmaceutical sciences to the most pressing uh, needs across the globe. Next slide, please. So with that, I summarized the aspects relevant to the pharmaceutical sciences and I'll hand over uh, back to the center. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you for sharing the board, board, board pharmaceutical uh, sciences in FIP. That's very interesting to know. And I believe like the audience here will be interested to find out more about it. So if you have any question, you can write it in the chat box provided in the in this uh, Zoom meeting. So the last but not least uh, on practice element, we will have Emma. So Emma, I'll give the screen to you for the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Desak. And I will be talking about the uh, practice element of this uh, important FIP goal. And thank you so much for having me uh, and um, congratulations to all that have already presented and hi to everyone who's watching. Uh, so um, when we are talking about the practice element when uh, for goal uh, 18, which is access to medicines, devices and services, we are talking about um, systems in place uh, that optimize access to effective medicines and pharmaceutical care services through appropriate supply chains, quality standards, self-care and prevention services, and affordability and fair pricing policies. So as you can see, it's a fairly uh, comprehensive uh, goal, and it uh, involves a lot of activities. Uh, and I will be talking about some of those activities and how the Board of Pharmaceutical Practice has been producing some uh, documents and is planning on uh, different uh, projects to uh, tackle uh, all these different aspects uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of pharmaceutical practice to ensure access to uh, medicines products and services so in the next slide uh, we uh, go we drill down a little bit more what we uh, intend uh, to describe um, in the systems so uh, it involves uh, systems and structures that ensure appropriate supply of and access to medicines and other health products, including medical devices, so this is really closely related to uh, the integrity of supply chains uh, and uh, making sure that um, uh, we are combating falsified and, um, and counterfeit medicines uh, and uh, that we uh, ensure that people who need medicines are able to access uh, those products. Uh, the second bullet uh, on the development and implementation of contingency plans for shortages of medicines and medical devices. Unfortunately, we have seen uh, an increased number of shortages in many different countries, 
um, in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, there are many uh, reasons, so it's uh, multi-causal uh, um, effect in, the, in FIP since already 2012. We have been working on uh, shortages and uh, trying to identify the causes and propose some recommendations, uh, namely to increase pharmacist scope of practice in order to be able to uh, act on these shortages by uh, facilitating interchange, uh, interchangeability uh, between uh, different uh, products and products and alternatives. Uh, so, um, like I said, FIP is working on this since 2012 uh, when we organized the World Summit in uh, Canada. But since then, uh, we have continuously updated our gui guidelines and, and guidance. Uh, for member organizations and also individual pharmacists to uh, cope with this uh, increasing um, problem. Uh, in the third bullet, we are talking about the development and implementation of quality standards and guidelines to ensure access to safe and effective medicines and medical devices, prevents the entry of substandard or falsified medicines in the legitimate supply chain, and ensure the stability of medicines in different environmental conditions, in addition to other safety and quality indicators. And for this, and I will show you uh, one of the documents that has been, um, that has been produced by FIP, uh, and which has already been updated and has been updated in collaboration with the, the World Health Organization about good pharmacy practice and how, uh, in fact, we are working on improving quality standards uh, and uh, making sure that the guidelines are in place and systems are in place that prevent um, uh, any uh, further uh, safety concerns. In the next slide, we continue with the uh, mechanisms. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that was it for the mechanism. So uh, in terms of the uh, practice element, like I said, uh, we work on the entire supply chain when we are talking about practice. So we are talking uh, about the uh, those pharmacists that are working in the pharmaceutical industry. So in the development, discovery, manufacturing and supply chain and procurement uh, and uh, in the board of pharmaceutical practice as uh, uh, in the case for the Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences, we also have groups uh, of uh, uh, pharmacists that represent a certain, uh, in the case of BPP, a certain area of practice. Uh, so we have um, an industrial pharmacy section uh, where um, most uh, pharmacists that uh, are involved in the industry uh, are represented uh, and those pharmacists uh, typically and historically develop their activity in the development, discovery and manufacturing. Of course, this is closely linked uh, to the uh, sciences uh, aspect as well uh, in terms of the uh, different uh, SIGs uh, and special in interest groups that uh, Giovanni has described. Uh, uh, but when we enter uh, the uh, medicine use proce process, uh, and this has to be seen and described both from the uh, on the population and individual level, uh, we also intervene in terms of influencing the prescription or even selecting uh, certain certain medications. So in some jurisdictions, uh, pharmacists have the right to prescribe either collaboratively or independently. Uh, and of course, for non-prescription medicines, we are the ones often uh, offering uh, our uh, advice. So we are providing access not only to the product, but also uh, in terms of the counseling on the use of the product itself. Uh, then we have the preparation and dispensing of medicines. So um, traditionally, also, we have a, a big um, a role uh, in terms of compounding uh, medicines uh, that are not available uh, as an industrialized uh, option and obviously also uh, on the uh, dispensing of the medicines themselves. Again, uh, this is providing access not only to the product, uh, but obviously also to a service, uh, which is the counseling uh, on the medicines. And more and more, we are uh, seeing more services being implemented in order to monitor medicines outcomes or even to administer medicines, as it's the, the case with uh, vaccines and particularly uh, in this context, pandemic con context, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And of course, the disposal of medicines is uh, also important and this links to another uh, one uh, of the FIP goals on the sustainability also of the uh, environment. 
Uh, obviously, this chain uh, where different pharmacists, uh, individual pharmacists are involved is uh, closely linked to uh, and interacts with the legal and regulatory framework. Uh, and uh, we have uh, quite a lot of pharmacists also working uh, in regulatory in order to ensure um, the uh, necessary assessment and evaluation of medicines before they are approved uh, to enter the market and also obviously in terms of their pharma, uh, the pharmacovigilance that has to follow uh, their entry into the market. Uh, and again, uh, and this has already been highlighted, this is, uh, is uh, closely linked also to the competencies foundation, so education, uh, foundational training, uh, and also the uh, advancement of um, additional competencies, as is the case in most countries for, for instance, for the uh, administration of vaccines. In the next slide, I provide some examples of documents and reports uh, which highlight the work that FIP has developed in terms of giving guidance uh, not only to member organizations, but also governments, individual pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists, and pharmacy educators in terms of what we can do um, to ensure access uh, to uh, quality medicines and medical devices and also uh, access to services that are provided by pharmacists in these different um, areas. Uh, so we have uh, for uh, an example of uh, a report we have produced on the pharmacists in the supply chain. Uh, and again, talking about supply chain integrity and the role of the pharmacist uh, in, the, in that respect. Uh, we have, um, as I mentioned, uh, we've organized in 2012 uh, this medicine shortages uh, summit, which uh, from which we have produced um, a report uh, and uh, this work has been ongoing and we have several updates and uh, new uh, statements, policy statements on this uh, topic as well. Uh, I've mentioned good pharmacy practice and the, this joint FIP WHO guidelines um, and this uh, basically uh, encompasses all the practice uh, aspects in terms of ensuring access and quality uh, to quality products and to quality services uh, in, uh, in pharmacy, uh, both in community and hospital pharmacy. Uh, and most recently, we have been producing a, a series of reports, which are more uh, like toolkits uh, to be able to really apply into practice all these new services that uh, pharmacists are uh, embracing, particularly in the community and hospital pharmacy uh, settings. Uh, so, and this one is the latest one that has been re released on medicines reconciliation. Uh, however, I do um, suggest uh, and recommend that you visit our webpage because on our webpage under publications, you will see many more uh, reports and statements that um, uh, or are already aligned with the uh, FIP development goal number 18. And finally, in the next slide, uh, uh, just to uh, uh, obviously all these uh, different goals, they are interconnected. Uh, so, uh, and we, when we are uh, talking about uh, access to services, we are talking about services that increase uh, patients quality of life. Uh, and uh, in BPP, we are working to develop a one FIP project that involves also uh, science and education uh, in order to transform uh, non-communicable diseases prevention and management, uh, both globally and regionally. Uh, and we will will be able to uh, give you more information about this uh, uh, um, in very shortly. Uh, so just to open your appetites uh, in terms of um, uh, different programs uh, where you can see really uh, what FIP is doing to advocate for an increased uh, pharmacist's uh, contribution uh, and uh, giving specific and practical tools for uh, the organizations and individual pharmacists to implement this uh, into practice in a way that is sustainable uh, and um, really uh, um, adds value to the healthcare system in general and to the patient in particular. So thank you very much uh, and I look forward to uh, any questions you may have on the uh, practice contribution to this uh, FIP development goal number 18. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you, Barbel, for the wonderful presentations. Uh, um, I will start by a question for all of you, and uh, maybe we can start by Barbel, then Giovanni, then Emma, about how we can integrate all these elements in order to 
have this one FIP or this goal be reached and uh, have the most outcome out of it? Barbara? Um, yeah, I try to explain that I believe really in surveys and I want to see my colleagues uh, responsible for the elements of practice and sciences to contribute to a survey to really understand needs and outcomes uh, related to access. And then uh, I would break it down to education because from and, and workforce development and education and training um, related to sciences and um, practice. Because for me, it's about uh, the patients. Remember our mission, universal health coverage. And it's about um, the customer of the customer, the patients, and it's for our frontline colleagues. Thank you, Barbara. Giovanni. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I strongly believe there, there are different approaches based on region. So, so I think um, understanding the regional needs is something we have to uh, identify and survey. Certainly one way is also uh, engagement with stakeholders at various levels, which is important. And then define short-term and long-term strategies that um, are required to improve the situation in that particular region. There might be short-term um, uh, collaboration and partnerships that could help to raise certain, some of the deficiencies immediately while then working on the more long-term strategy through educational changes um, which usually aren't that fast uh, and produce then a stable well-prepared workforce down the road. So I think we need to look at all the tools that are available in order to um, overcome some of the shortfalls that are present in that particular region. Thank you. Emma? Well, I, think, uh, I believe that uh, we can all only offer access to uh, medicines, medical devices uh, and services if we are uh, on top of uh, our competence uh, and that involves edu uh, sound education and training. And obviously we have to rely on science to provide us with the evidence not only in terms of what enters the market. Uh, and when I'm talking about enters the market, I'm talking both in terms of products and services because there, are, there is a lot of research also uh, surrounding pharmaceutical services to uh, understand how they can become uh, more efficient and how they can uh, be implemented um, and finding the right indicators also to then uh, ascertain whether those services are being uh, successful. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, uh, once we start to practice, we need further education and we need additional training uh, because the evidence is always um, uh, out there. So uh, uh, I believe that the, the, there is a clear integration of, uh, of uh, all these uh, aspects uh, already if you want to provide access to uh, products and, and services that are uh, of quality and uh, that uh, really add value to the to the person because uh, again evidence is uh, changing every uh, every day so we have to be very closely linked to the sciences to uh, be able to incorporate uh, that uh, evidence into what we do uh, and training is absolutely uh, fundamental for that within FIP what we have done to integrate all elements is to have a very close collaboration between the different boards and PPEDs so uh, board of Pharmaceutical Practice, the Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences, uh, and FIPED, the way that we are organized uh, in the, uh, within FIP allows us to um, interact uh, and actually fosters collaboration and um, uh, more uh, holistic projects that involve all uh, aspects uh, of uh, practice science and education. So we are walking the talk, uh, as you usually say. <laughs> Yeah, Emma, we have a timely question about what are the recommendations to avoid shortage of medicine, like what happened with the non-communicable diseases patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. And people are like being proactive to think about other like problems that may arise and how we can prevent such uh, uh, shortage in medicine. Well, that, that is the million dollar question, right? Uh, yeah. We've been uh, handling, well, we've been discussing it since 2012 and I don't think that anyone has the, 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 um, the uh, solution uh, for it, but we do have some uh, answers and we, we do have some solutions that mitigate uh, 
uh, the, uh, the problem and those have been identified and are included in our uh, most recent report. But uh, I think that uh, what this uh, pandemic context uh, has brought to us is another way and another perspective for regulators to look at supply chains. Uh, because uh, uh, I believe that uh, in the past few decades, uh, we have seen an increased pressure, economic pressure in terms of uh, to the in the pharmaceutical industry and the supply chain as a whole to increase efficiency. And that efficiency uh, usually is very closely linked to um, centralizing certain uh, activities like manufacturing in one place uh, in, uh, in large quantities. Um, and, uh, and we have seen a, a shift also in terms of where the manufacturing uh, is done. And what I think that the pandemic context brought was that uh, we, although we are in a globalized world, uh, sometimes there are things that may disrupt um, transportation, may disrupt this globalized um, um, way of living, uh, and that we have to be sure that we are able to activate local responses uh, and, uh, and uh, regional uh, responses. So uh, on that respect, in terms of the supply, I think that uh, we have uh, something to learn about this um, Context, pandemic context. On the other hand, uh, this pandemic context has already um, also proved uh, that an expanded role for pharmacists, uh, and we have seen an increased number of pharmacists being able to renew prescriptions, uh, to um, prescribe, to administer vaccines. So uh, all these activities that allow us to um, ensure uh, continuity of access to medicines and services in collaboration with other healthcare professionals, of course, uh, but we have seen a lot of changes, regulatory changes to allow pharmacists to do much more during this pandemic context. And uh, we hope uh, that this trend will continue and that these activities will be maintained even after the uh, COVID pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Emma. Um, we have another question from the uh, audience. Um, maybe this time we'll go to Giovanni. We were talking about regulatory requirements and our question says how FIP works in align, uh, to align different regulatory requirement implemented by health authorities in each country. And I would add to this question, the idea of science and the vaccine development, for example, for COVID, as we were talking with uh, Emma just now, and the accessibility of the vaccine to the patients. So uh, Giovanni, the floor is yours for this uh, double uh, question. Thank you. Uh, it, it is important that communications happen between those individual authorities that make independent decisions based on scientific evidence. And what we can provide from an FIP perspective is sharing of information that is valid and uh, peer reviewed because without that information, there is no regulatory authority that will be confident in making decisions to either approve or not to approve uh, certain products for medical use. And I think that's something that we can, we're certainly working uh, particularly with the WHO and facilitating that, identifying opportunities for providing actually scientific information to the WHO that then can be disseminated via their network. And that's related to um, the approach that we currently take in order to facilitate approval of medical product with limited clinical trials or no clinical trials at, out, uh, at all if efficacy and safety have been proven. So, so there are several projects that we're working on and it really comes down to the information and sharing of information of scientific evidence. With regards to the COVID vaccine, um, it's certainly a little bit more complex because of capabilities of manufacturing and the assessment um, of the safety of those products. Some of them we have seen are brand new in terms of the mechanism of action. And I think that, that adds a little bit more com complex uh, situation to the vaccines. However, I think we also have seen um, that there was a huge cooperation across the globe in terms of sharing information, in terms of collaboration um, across the different manufacturers involved in that, that has then ultimately um, the benefit of faster introduction, maybe not fast enough for a lot of us, but at least faster introduction than um, under normal standard conditions. Thank you, Giovanni. Um
Our last question is for Barbel. Barbel, maybe how we can integrate both uh, all the aspects and how we can prepare our workforce. And if you want to talk about education also, how to prepare the future pharmacist for the idea or this goal of access. So what they should know, how we should integrate it and when we should integrate it. Um. I'd like to work with a kind of a definition or a common understanding on access and pharmaceutical access. And depending on the uh, competencies already in the workforce uh, and depending on the curricula in the countries, I would uh, see additional modules in the education and additional offers in the um, postgraduate education. Mm -hmm. And how we can talk about patient engagement and access, how we can relate them. Okay, I'm, I'm, I like listening to the ongoing discussion about the change from uh, shareholder economy to stakeholder economy. And here I see the patients because it's about universal health coverage, about the patients. And I think about uh, our profession and our role in the health system. And I think if we um, pay attention and draw the attention of the patients to their health and the prevention, um, and not only the treatment, we could, could educate them, we could advise them, and we could get them engaged and uh, utilize them for the patient engagement as leverage effect for our uh, pharmacist role and the visibility of pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists in the health system. Mm. Does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Mm. Emma, uh, we have a question about when we have prescriber pharmacists, how this would affect the uh, uh, access to medicine and access to services. And also when we have a heterogeneous situation where some services or some counseling is remunerated for pharmacists compared in other countries where it is not remunerated, how this would affect access to medicine and services and devices. Yes, um, uh, I am a firm believer of the uh, think globally, act locally uh, concept uh, in that you have to adapt to cultural circumstances, economic uh, circumstances, and uh, also uh, what the needs are uh, in the different regions and in the different countries. So not all countries will, um, uh, will uh, need the same services provided by pharmacists. What we want to ensure in FIP is that we uh, provide uh, MOs and individual pharmacists with the right e equipment uh, and tools to identify which are the specific needs uh, in their uh, region and then uh, several solutions that may be implemented in order to um, be able to uh, respond to people's needs. Uh, so, uh, of course, we are uh, also firm supporters of remuneration models that support uh, this advancement and the changes that have to occur so that pharmacists may be able to provide more services and be able to optimize medication outcomes more than just provide access to the product itself, which is in itself an important task, but is not the, the mission. The mission is to optimize the outcomes of that product in the person uh, who will use it. So in terms of the remuneration models, of course, we are uh, advocating for remuneration models that um, remunerate specifically uh, the services that are being provided uh, and that are less dependent on um, the, the product itself and the prices of the medication because the counseling itself uh, has to have um, uh, has a value uh, in itself. Uh, uh, having said that, of course, that uh, traditionally people have been uh, used are used to go to the pharmacies and get their counseling uh, for free. And I think that this will be very difficult to change for the future, but uh, more, uh, uh, but the remuneration model for the dispensing of the medications as to include uh, uh, the, the, the value attributed to the counseling itself. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, we have to find um, other ways of remunerating more uh, 
complex services or more uh, like medicines uh, reconciliation or medicine use reviews um, because they have uh, concrete uh, added value to the patient once they are implemented. Uh, just as a final remark in terms of the pharmacies prescribing, I think that it is very important that we work as a team with the other healthcare professionals. We are not competing, but we are collaborating in order to ensure access. In, and again, in some jurisdictions that may happen with a collaborative practice agreement in which the pharmacist is prescribing collaboratively with the prescriber. Uh, we have renewal of prescriptions in many different countries, and we have independent prescribing in, uh, in some other countries, uh, which in fact also involves communication with uh, the physician. So what we do have to ensure is, th is that uh, every healthcare uh, member of the team is comfortable with the position, that we are not in competition, but we are actually complementing each other in the, in the healthcare team. Thank you. We have questions coming, a lot of questions coming to the chat and to the question and answer uh, box. We will be answering those questions there. Uh, we thank you all for being here. And now I will uh, give the floor to uh, my colleague, Chris John, to uh, introduce the final part of our uh, session today. Chris, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris John. I am the FIP lead for data and intelligence, and I'm just going to briefly short uh, talk to you about the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory and how we monitor and evaluate development goals, and with a particular focus on this development goal, access to medicines, devices, and services. Next slide, please. So the FIP, Global Pharmaceutical Observatory's mission, centers around data, intelligence, advocacy, and reporting. We know the importance of data and for data to provide us with evidence and for evidence to provide us with intelligence. So our first task is to collate valid global data on workforce, education, practice, and pharmaceutical science. And we will do this for each of the development goals. We must undertake comprehensive analyses of collated data to provide accessible, high quality intelligence. And all this must be communicated innovatively to promote our member organizations and their impacts on health. This communication will often be via the FIP Atlas, which is our visualization platform uh, for displaying our intelligence across the globe. We will be placing this on our website. And finally, we will provide evidence-based strategic information, reports, and guidance on the application of pharmaceutical science policies, practices, and services. Next slide, please. The FIP GPO outputs and inferences are listed here. And firstly, we will be sharing and disseminating intelligence that informs policy formation and advocates for the profession. We will be also undertaking country monitoring, reporting and information comparisons. These could be benchmarking for how many pharmacies, prescriptions, regulatory comparisons, vaccinations, service comparisons, to name but a few examples. We'll also be undertaking research and analyses uh, evaluation of trends to support action planning and facilitating collaborative working and national and transnational working, bringing nations and organizations together to deliver transformational projects. We'll also be undertaking evidence generation for capacity building, looking at provide, uh, potential for linkages with other observatories such as the World Health Organization and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And the reason why we're here today is we'll be looking at health system strengthening by tracking progress against development goals. Next slide, please. Just to give you a brief update on current Global Pharmaceutical Observatory actions and projects, current work across the GPO includes the METNA project, which is a first global pilot of 
mapping education and workforce needs assessment using the FIP development goals as a framing device. METNA stands for Multinational Education and Training Needs Assessment. We are aiming to for data retrieval in partnership with member organizations and other organizations and using the project to develop a comparative assessment in terms of priorities across regional commonalities. The project is supported through external unrestricted funds and an FIP commissioned piece of work. The main aim of this project is to address multinational needs based education for the pharmaceutical workforce in a cohort of nations across the globe and to evaluate policy gaps on a regular basis. As previously mentioned, we're also working on our Atlas, our online visualization platform to display important intelligence and particularly intelligence relating to the development goals. Linked to this is the development of the dedicated GPO website and database, which will serve as a repository for all the data we collect. We are advised on the strategic uh, direction of our work by the One FIP Data and Intelligence Commission, which meets regularly to discuss big ticket items that provide assurance and guidance on achieving the GPO vision and mission. And indeed, the Commission met uh, just last Wednesday and had a good discussion around the success measures of the GPO over the next five years. Finally, the reason why we're here today, as I've said, we have an important project that aims to produce indicators that will measure and monitor progress towards the development goals, which is where you all come in. Next slide, please. FIP is now seeking to develop indicators and country level metrics to measure and monitor progress and the performance of implementation of the FIP development goals via the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. So during this event, we would like you to seek your support for this Global Indicators and Metrics project by contributing to this brief activity linked to the current FIP digital event about development goal 18, which you've joined about access to medicines, devices and services. We would like to know your opinions about how this development goal can be monitored and measure, measured. So you will receive an email to complete this activity after the event, if you don't complete it during the event. But um, if you'd like to have a quick look uh, now, it's only, only a quick activity. Uh, we do need your help and expertise in engaging with a brief five minute activity and this will as I've said, it will help us develop indicators and metrics to measure and monitor progress with the implementation of Development Goal 18. So to participate, all you need to do is click on the link at the bottom of the slide if you can, or you can use your mobile phone if you have one to hand to uh, look at that QR code and that will bring up the, the activity on your phone. There'll also be a link in the chat box if you wanted to click on that as well. That's all I had to say for today. Thanks so much for your attention and joining this event today. And I'll hand you back to the moderators. Thank you, Chris. Thank you everyone for your attention. And as mentioned, please go to the link that has been sent to you in the chat box. Or if you cannot do it now, tomorrow you'll be receiving a feedback email from this, a follow-up email from this uh, session where you have also the link to go and to visit this five-minute survey. Thank you. Uh, Desar? Uh, thanks, Mawan. So uh, to, as a reminder for our next episode, on 50G16 on communicable disease, because we understand that, FIP understand that during this pandemic, we might overwhelm with the COVID, so, but we could not leave behind all the communicable disease. And I think this was one of the questions asked from the uh, audience today. So please uh, note on your calendar on 29th of April, and you can log in to events.fip.org uh, or for other future uh, FIP events, you can uh, click on events fip.org. I think that is all from me, Marwan. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for all the speakers, for the all panelists.
It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Desak. Thank you, our speaker, Barbara, Emma, and Giovanni, for your valuable contribution. And thank you, Chris, for the GPO presentation. Uh, we have to know that access to medicine, services, and devices is heterogeneous all over the world. So we do not have a standard for it. However, what we can do is always to optimize it and to work more and more in order to get our patients have access to all what they need from medications to services to devices. And another point also came today is the access to, to information. The pharmacist is just trusted person. You can get the information you want about all the diseases, all the medication from the pharmacist. We are the most accessible. You can come to us and we are also a part of the healthcare team in order to provide you with the best of your health. Thank you and see you in future events. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.